a uh, 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 Raul Castro moment, on and on and on with the weeping and the crying and the leaning over the podium, has nothing to say about North Korea. Why is that? Because he's not going to take on something major. You saw what he did with the Syrian red line. You see how he treats the Crimean crisis. So, Anything in other words, he's a real he's a real hero when it comes to beating up the American middle class, who he threatens virtually on on a, on a regular basis. But when it comes to real dictatorships, he's nowhere to be found. He's a community organizer. You said it yourself, and he is. He yeah, can only well, yeah. Just back from vacation, the first thing he does is attack the white middle class heterosexual Christian gun owner. That's who he was attacking yesterday. You didn't hear any outcry from the. Uh, from the uh, projects about gun control, did you? Because they're never going to be affected by a gun seizure or by gun laws because they're, they're lawless, fundamentally. The gangs are running in a, in a lawless set of communities across America. They're not concerned with this little tepid attacks upon the Second Amendment because it doesn't apply to them. Well, who's to suffer? It's the person who is a legitimate person in society who is exercising their right to, say, have a gun, Okay. And do, do you do you go? I want. I don't want to go down the gun road. Are you a gun owner? Yes, I am. And you live in or outside of New York City? I live in Brooklyn, New York. Are you allowed to own a pistol in New York? No, I didn't say pistol. It's a long gun. I cannot own a pistol, and I'll tell you why. Because I've tried to get the permit. It's very prohibitive. It's almost. It's one day a week where you can go down and apply for it, it's over $400. And you don't get a refund if you get denied. You have to show cause, whether you're... You know, you're, when I grew up in New York, when I grew up in New York City, there was a thing called the Sullivan Law. Do you recall that at all? Yes, I do. Okay, the Sullivan Law prohibited the use of handguns by anyone except police and a few very specialized individuals, probably off-duty, uh, I, I would say detectives and whatnot. Um, that's an interesting law unto itself. Do you think everyone should be allowed to own a handgun in New York City? I think uh, someone who is law-abiding, who doesn't have a uh, felonious record or uh, domestic violence, like, you know, obviously mental health issues, I think um, it would be safer in New York. I've been on the subway. That's how I get to work. And uh, I sometimes think to myself when there's someone on the train who's a little out of their mind, not that I want to shoot anyone. That's the last thing I think a response. Well, you see, here's the problem. As you got to understand, if you ever did use that pistol in self-defense in a subway, you, you'd lose no matter what you did. You know that, don't you? Oh, yeah. I've, I've lived here my whole life. I know that very well. <laughs> the courts would crucify you if you shot a madman on the subway. They'd claim that he was no threat to you. He wasn't posing an imminent threat to your life. You had no right to be a policeman. Even if you said you were defending a poor woman who he was molesting, you would you would have the book thrown at you. You know that, don't you? Sure. And you know it even more because you're in San Francisco and you're from here. So you know it even well, more. Well, I, I know it from both sides, and I've often analyzed what I would do if, God forbid, I were in such a situation. I have to tell you, I wouldn't be John Wayne. I would not be John Wayne. You know, a lot of guys say, oh, if I had a gun, I'd be John Wayne. They wouldn't be John Wayne be smarter if they weren't John Wayne with their gun. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't be able to defend yourself within your home or within your vehicle. That's a little different, isn't it? If you study the laws on self-defense and on using a weapon in self-defense, they're very clear. You know and I know you have to be in imminent danger of bodily harm. You know that, don't you? Yes. No, how do you define that? How do you define, how do you, how do you prove you are in imminent danger of of uh, bodily harm. What, did you perceive it to be so? Or uh, can you prove it? Was the man larger than you or smaller than you? Was he younger than you or older than you? That wouldn't even matter if he had no weapon. Do you know that? Let's say it's a young man, six foot five, who's punching you, and you're five foot six and you have a gun. That doesn't mean that you have to use the gun. According to the idiot liberals in the courts, they would say he had no gun and you did and you killed him. That's how the law is. It's insane. By the way, I've studied this in and out. It's a no-win situation, which is a problem for gun owners, by the way. It's a bigger problem than what Obama did yesterday. Well, what he has is an agenda, and we all know what that is. Okay? Yeah, we know what the agenda is, right. A completely docile, paralyzed uh, electorate that he can manipulate any which way he wants on a daily basis. My friend, I am sending you a New Year's present, Government Zero. I'll be back in a minute to take your calls right here on the Savage Nation. Well, it 
is absolutely uh, obvious to anyone, even on the liberal side, who has a, a fair mind that America's credibility has disintegrated in world affairs under uh, this community organizer. The fact of the matter is, look at what Iran is doing. Look at what North Korea is doing. If this is not an indicator of the disintegration of American credibility on the world stage, I'd like to know what would be. And yet, the left will not acknowledge it. They're committed forever to Chairman Mao Bao. They don't care about Iran. They don't care about North Korea. The American left cares very, very little about anything except their very myopic, narrow, banded agenda on the domestic front. And they are dictating what goes on in the White House, in my opinion. Now, never forget that Obama repeatedly assured us, we the citizens, that although the United States was handing over $150 billion in sanctions relief to Iran under his alleged deal, that he would not hesitate to sanction Iran for its violation of any other obligations, but he hasn't done so. Obama reassured us that should Iran violate the nuclear deal itself, the sanctions that were imposed against it for racing to acquire nuclear weapons would snap back. Remember that? Remember him and Kerry lied over and over again about snapback? I didn't believe those assurances then. Do you still believe them uh, now? Do you believe it now? You know that he lies about everything. Iran's ballistic missile program now poses a significant threat to regional and global security. This is a clear fact, and yet nothing has, has happened from the White House. The White House has not announced any new sanctions. None. In fact, last Wednesday at 10.30 a.m., the White House said that sanctions would be imposed on Iranians involved in these sanctions. And then what happened? At 11.12 a.m., the White House sent word that its announcement would be delayed for a few hours. And then at 10 p.m. the same day, the White House said that sanctions would be delayed indefinitely. And then by Friday, the White House was saying that it was still thinking about it. What is causing the White House to reverse its position on Iran? Does anyone really know? Does anyone really know who's running this country? We know that the Obama administration is certainly not running this country. Let's go to the callers. KBET in Las Vegas. Ivan, welcome to the Savage Nation. Yes, Michael. Just wanted to kind of... Uh debunk the myth that everybody from the Eastern Bloc is a hard-working person that comes here to the American dream. I can guarantee a 90% plus of them are just here to scam the system. Look at, look at the way it is. They're just lazy, Michael. Look at the Eastern Bloc. After all this time, they still looks like a ghetto from Brooklyn, for God's sake. The people, once they face communism, that they get free stuff, they will never go back to work. It's no different than the people in welfare. And it's no different for them here. Look, I know this from 20 years ago. I have a friend who's a urologist, I shall say, in a big city in America. And uh, a large number of his community consists of Russian emigres. He told me stories of abuse that would make your head roll. He said they came here from the Soviet Union, and many of them brought the same corruption that they ran away from, and then imposed it upon America, and they're sucking the system dry. That's what he said to me. So, I mean, it's not, not new to me. I don't see them as great upstanding Americans who are working hard to advance themselves and love America. Not at all. They ran from the Soviet Union, and they have hit the jackpot. Everything that Papa Stalin promised their grandfather and never delivered, Uncle Sam is delivering on a silver platter, and they're giving nothing back. That's what he said to me. You're absolutely right, Michael. My own father, we defected, you know, in 1981, and first of all, we went to Canada. And all of a sudden, I started realizing, wait a second, they just take all this money from nothing from me. And my father was perfectly happy to do nothing. They give you, like, a free apartment, free utensils even. And I said, this is not for me. I, I didn't run away from, from communism to become here more communism. It was just... No, you're, well, you're right, but America did the same thing. When I saw the Russian emigres coming here and being put ahead of the American citizen for positions in the university, that's when I knew something was so wrong with the system. And it's not gotten any better, it's gotten much worse. So, yes, I agree that in all ethnic groups and in all immigrant groups, there are those who come here to abuse the system, not to work, this, not to work uh, within the system. They work the system instead. Now, you yourself came from Canada, and well, I assume you built a life for yourself, correct? No, what, what is it that you, that you, what do you do, Ivan? What's your living? Well, I have a couple of companies, I mean, in the entertainment business, 
And um, like I said, it's, it's a hard work. People are not willing to put the hard work. And not only that, it kind of makes me very upset when they put, like, again, the Stalin, you know, reach against poor, the bourgeoisie and, and the proletariat. It's, it's a nonsense, you know. Try to open your own business and do the right thing the right way. This is a lot harder than going scamming the business, I tell you. Well, we know that. It is very hard to do things the right way in America. It's harder than anyone could imagine. And for that reason... Sometimes you don't uh, even doubt why people take the easy way <laughs> take the easy way out. But really, how much can you really live on handouts or welfare in America? You really can't live very well, Ivan. You know that if you want to lead a decent life, you have to work for it here. Yeah, maybe they're scamming, and some of them are really rich uh, in their scams. But the majority of people who are living on welfare or free housing and a this and a food stamp and a little black market here, they're not living that well, are they? They are not living well at all, but you know what? It beats going to work. Because yeah, okay, and it beats what they what they would have had in the ex-Soviet Union, which is their model. It's not the current Russia either. They probably wouldn't do very much, do very well in the current Russia either, would they? They will not. But the bottom line is the tummy is full and nothing. That's it. That's why you see the Eastern Bloc people. They always have like the gold chain and all the other stuff. Because <laughs> when I was growing up. You cannot own anything. You cannot work. So all the valuable possessions to show your, that you're rich, you can wear it on you. That's all you have. Everybody lives in the same apartment. You're not talking about Brooklyn, are you? Because that's what it looks like in Brooklyn to me right now. They wear it on their bodies. That's it's it. like, you know, the, the, it's like the real, the real housewives of Brooklyn seem to wear it on their bodies. No, but my point is this. Yes, you can live in America pretty poorly on welfare and food stamps and scams and a little black market and a little but you're not going to do that well if you really want to do well you still have to work very hard and build something don't you or provide a a service or a, be a performer you have to do something to get ahead and really live well you can't live a large life on the bottom of the social scale on welfare Ivan uh, thank you for calling I'm sending you government zero for your entertainment business I almost asked you what kind of entertainment it is you provide, but that's your business, not, not mine. I like the entertainment business because, frankly, I wish that more of my radio show was about entertainment instead of agony. Unfortunately, in the world that we're living, it's going to be harder and harder in 2016 to entertain you than it will be to antagonize you with the reality of the times we're living in. That's it for today. Thanks for listening to The Savage Nation. Hope to see you uh, tomorrow on the very same stations. Good night and God bless America. Savage.